The models also offer some disadvantages, especially net present value calculations need a lot of data, a lot of uh, critical thinking upfront and also during the process. Hello and welcome to the Gross Profit Podcast. My name is James Kennedy. I'm CEO at procurementexpress.com. We help you manage your company's spend with magical features, but we're not here to talk about that today. You should listen to this podcast if you are part of a team that is responsible for making major spending decisions in your business, generally CapEx decisions. So sometimes it can feel like even if the numbers get bigger, the reasoning behind them and the, the methodology behind making decisions can still feel a little bit loose, but it needn't be that way. There are academic ways of looking about making better decisions that you can stand behind and justify no matter what happens. Today, I've invited along an expert, Patrick Patka, that we met recently at, in Prague at the CFO Forum. Uh, to tell us more about this. And I've invited him because he lectures on the topic, has taught many, many, probably hundreds of people how to do it at this stage. Thank you very much for coming to the Gross Profit Podcast. Maybe you could just introduce yourself for people who have not already met you. Thanks a lot, James. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for the um, kind invitation to your podcast. Really appreciate it. And um, to myself, um, born and raised in Austria, in the middle of Europe, I am a uh, finance professional, if you want, uh, currently managing director of uh, my own company, doing interim management and consulting in terms of uh, finance uh, business strategy. And uh, beside to that, uh, lecture at uh, various universities in Austria uh, in the field of finance strategy and also HR. Let's start with the basics. Um, so what is a, you know, a CapEx evaluation model and why is it crucial for a business? To say it in a very simple way, it's an, an Excel calculation, yeah, if you want. So you um, take an Excel template, um, then you have some certain information, data, and KPIs to fill in. And then there are one, two, three formulas calculating this uh, very fancy uh, KPIs, uh, for example, a net present value, an internal rate of return, or a payback period. And at the end of the day, with this um, two, three KPIs, top management, executive level or so on management boards have to decide which of the projects will be realized and which not. So at the end of the day, it's a little bit technical in terms of the calculation. And on the other side, it's a little bit technical in terms of uh, data generation and data aggregation, which is done um, at least 99% in Excel. Okay. So uh, you mentioned a couple of different models at a high level there. Payback period, which I guess is easy to understand, nest present value and internal rate of revert, return. Could you just compare them? Uh, what are they and, uh, in layman's language? Like, and how do they, why might you pick one over the other? I think it's uh, very simple to understand the payback period because you can compare it with your private life. Yeah? Um, if you spend uh, 1,000 euro for something and you get uh, 333.333 uh, euros back, then the payback period is more or less three years. So it shows us um, the time when the investment uh, got paid off. There is another one a little bit more advanced. It's called the discounted uh, payback period, um, which is then calculated. You take the investment, so the initial investment amount, and then you have the discounted cash flows in the future. And it's um, then reflected to um, the time period um, in regard to these discounted cash flows. Yeah? It's always in years. So in general, a rule of thumb is three to four, three to five years of payback period is uh, quite okay. And this project shall be realized. On the other hand, you have a little bit more um, fancy KPI called net present value, which is um, in, an, in an easy way to understand um, the initial investment, for example, 1 million, and then on a time uh, range or duration of 10 years, for example, you generate um, cash flows, you add these cash flows, but before you add these cash flows, you have to discount them. And there is a very crucial aspect in it, the uh, discount rate. 
and to come to this discount rate, this is the tricky part at the end of the day. But before, um, these discounted cash flows are summed up and then um, subtracted from the investment and the net present value should always be positive because then you generate uh, cash and then the project shall be realized. This is the rule out of economics and out of the books. But uh, what I always try to tell my students, it's not only the one side of the coin, there's also another side because not only the figures are essential to take the decision, also for example, strategic implications. So also a project not generating cash, maybe burning cash a little bit can be realized um, if you or if top management decides to, because they say, okay, due to some strategic implications, we need this project, we want to realize it. And then on uh, the last uh, KPI is uh, internal rate of return, IRR. This is um, commonly used or applied uh, in big corporates, so corporations, because it's a kind of a, a hurdle, yeah? so a hurdle rate also called, um, which the project has to pass. And the idea of the IRR is more or less nearly the same like the net present value. It's just a little bit switched because the IRR is a percentage and it tells you or tells us, for example, an IRR of 14%. If you apply this 14% as the discount rate, then the net present value is zero. So the question is at which discount rate the net present value is zero. So the project doesn't generate any cash. And so you have to take this hurdle and every percentage of the IRR better than, for example, the 14% shall be realized. And therefore it's commonly used in corporates as a kind of a, a guideline yeah? or a, a, a guiding line you have to hit. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, the most commonly used one uh, in the business world is the net present value calculation. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, so I guess, to, first of all, the important thing is to compare the, the same number with the same number amongst your projects. So it's the job number one. And you brought up something very interesting there, which is the cost of doing nothing, or let's say the, co the option doing nothing is always a, an option. So if I have and that money sitting in the company bank account, I guess I need to set a, a kind of a hurdle rate over which I could just actually invest that money in an index fund in the stock market. That, at that say I can imagine I get 7%. Uh, so that's always the first choice to consider. And which, which of those numbers, net present value, IR or, or payback period, are easiest to compare to just sticking it into a, you know, a bank, uh, whatever, into a bond or into the stock market, assuming a 7% return. If you want to compare it uh, with this, then I would recommend the IRR um, because the net present value is an absolute amount. It's a euro, so you cannot compare it with the percentage. Yet. And the payback period is uh, time duration, so it's in years. So if you, as you said, it's very important always to compare apple with apples and not apples with bananas. Um, so the IRR um, as a certain kind of percentage rate. And for example, if you, um, as you mentioned, the bond uh, um, with 7% per annum, for example, and you have an IRR of uh, 8%, then you know with the 8% um, discount rate, so you have to discount the cash flows, is then the net present value zero. It's not one-to-one -one comparable at the end of the day but it gives you a kind of an indication. Yeah? So if you have to choose one of the three, take the IRR, but be careful, it's not one-to-one uh, -one comparable at all. Okay, so I guess then on any project for most businesses, you're looking for an IRR at least 10% or more, even to factor in the risk at uh, the starting point. Okay, and are, is one type of model like more prevalent in a particular industry, like, uh, or is it if you're making different types, are there categories of different types of spend where one model is more appropriate than the other? For sure, for sure. For example, when it comes to net present value calculations, where we have really also huge amounts of euros at the end of the day, then we are in the production industry, um, we also calculate a lot of projects for example, different kind of machines they want to invest for just one plant at the end of the day, doing 20, 30, 40. Um, 
investment appraisal models for 40, 50, 60, 80 different kind of machines, um, looking which uh, offers at the end of the day the biggest amount of net present value and uh, which of this um, machine should then be uh, realized or bought at the end of the day. Um, when you look a little bit more onto the smaller businesses, for example, so the smaller structure, not that much uh, resources or capacities in terms of personnel and also know-how, then you're more on the, let's say, basic side of the calculation models. And when we look at it uh, from an academic uh, point of view, then you always distinguish uh, two bigger streams uh, within investment models. The one is the static models and the other ones are the dynamic. And the dynamic are the state of the art, so net present value, IRR and so on. And the static ones are more the, let's name it very simple one and also simplified ones because the, the basic um, calculation uh, model in the static um, venue is called uh, cost comparison. And this is done in your private life. So in everyone's private life, if you buy an iPhone or maybe a laptop yeah, or a notebook, you compare, okay, what is the highest cost or the lowest cost? And then you decide. No? And this is more or less the, the basic uh, model. On the other uh, side, academia says, okay, it's very, very simplified, um, not dynamic in terms of the time period, not comparable with other ones. So for the <laughs> professional business world, uh, we neglect this. So it's really, really for the really, really, really small businesses. And um, to come back to the initial part of your question, in terms of branches, it's very important for the branches uh, which also have a high amount of capex budget per year. So the higher the capex budget um, per year, also the models and the intensity of the application of the models is higher. Okay. So what I heard there was you have to think about the audience of the people who are going to be making the decision. So for a finance civilian like myself, I'll be easier for me to understand the payback period. Go for your, I guess your recommendation sounds like go with the figure that can be easily understood by the stakeholders if all else fails. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For example, when it comes to this uh, free KPIs in a very, very fancy business world and uh, I worked for an um, um, international market leader in the, in the housing and building industry, CapEx budget in a, to 250 million um, range. Um, there, one calculation shows you the net present value, the IRR, and the discounted payback period. So you have all three KPIs in one template um, to really, really compare all the projects in a very fundamental way and not to get irritated maybe by just one KPI. Yeah? So it's a very holistic approach at the end of the day. My recommendation is use the KPI, which is also easy to communicate because payback period, everyone has something in mind or net present value. If you tell them, if you realize the projects in five years, you generate 500K of cash. Everyone, simple to understand. IRR is a little bit harder. Okay. Well, I'd like to get into it, maybe a case study example in a second. But before I do that, what are these models not good for? Like, what are their, what are their flaws, if you like? What can they not do? The models also offer some disadvantages and um, especially net present value calculations need a lot of data, a lot of uh, critical thinking upfront and also during the process. And at the end of the day, it's a calculation maybe run by Microsoft Excel or the like in a system and uh, it's just one side of the metal, so it's just the figures itself. No? And if you want to have a really a clear decision, you need a little bit more than just the data. So always keep in mind, if you apply such um, models or techniques, it's just one part of the game. And on the other side, it's also due to the complexity of the model, because the basic logic is the discounted cash flow, um, there are also potential areas of, um, I don't want to name it errors or typos, also misinterpretation of data or misinterpretation of the input of this um, model. So there you have to be very, very careful. And that's what I said um, a few minutes before. If 
a company does not have the capacities also in terms of the know-how, then better go with a more simplified model than taking the more fancy one. I guess there's a risk that you can do all the analysis you want. At some stage, someone has to take some risk and that's, there's no way you can get around that. I, I think I understand the, the models in a podcast doing the mathematics is not going to work out for us, but I understand that they're there and obviously you can get quite complicated with these if you want to. I presume you can spend hours and days and months and years analyzing. Some stage though, you got to make a decision. So let's talk about um, a case study or an example that you've seen before um, to sort of put some meat on bones. How would you go around? Maybe we can talk about, have you got a, a case study in mind? Yeah, and that's the... I think the most common uh, case study uh, when it comes to uh, also very fancy uh, CapEx appraisal model, um, opening a new restaurant or for example, investing and uh, reshaping, remodel an existing one. And maybe it's also very good to illustrate a little bit the complexity because on the one side, the new opening uh, is fed with data, which is based on a third party, the construction company and so on. Uh, you have to think a little bit about um, the financing perspectives. Uh, do you need a bank loan and so on, um, equity? There are really, really plenty of aspects, but at the end of the day, it's the easier case. Yeah, Because if you look at the existing one, you have to renegotiate maybe a rent. Um, there, beside the operational uh, restrictions, also maybe some new legal requirements you have to take care of. And then you also have to keep it in mind for the calculation because maybe you have to invest something new for a new uh, equipment part of the kitchen um, you need now. And then if you compare these two, there's always the big risk of saying, okay, what are the advantages of the new opening and what are the advantages of uh, renewing or remodel the existing one? And this is the part the model cannot answer. Yeah? So you have some certain kind of input data, input fields, input um, information, but um, this is more or less than based uh, on the evaluation of the engineering team, the operations team, also in collaboration with finance. And as I said before, the final decision has to be taken then by the management uh, management board or the, the, the shareholders, for example. And here, the tricky part is really to differentiate between um, just the investment itself and the advantage at the end of the day, also on the long run, yeah? because the calculation is based maybe on a 10, 15 years projection and to look in this crystal ball for 10, 15 years is quite hard, yeah? but also in both cases. So the same for the new opening, like for renewing the existing one. And therefore, um, if you take this case, it illustrates a little bit that the appraisal model itself is supportive, but it's not the, let's say the golden egg yeah? or the answer itself. Yeah? So it's just one part of the game. And there are also more aspects to uh, consider than just the figures itself. So it sounds like it can get, you can keep it quite simple or it can get uh, quite as complicated as you want almost. So if, if you, at what stage, what, what sort of size of purchase would you recommend? Let's say, just do it in Excel yourself, buying a book, for hiring a consultant to help me. Uh, what sort of milestones are there generally? Like, is there... A, I'm buying something for more than a million or what's the general stage at which it's worth investing in maybe professional help for evaluating some of these models? So if we talk about the, the amount, um, I think there is no uh, rule of thumb yeah, to say, I don't know, starting at the 300K, um, but to keep in mind, um, doing it for a 10K investment is not worth it yeah, because you have to invest really between five and 10 hours for, the for uh, gathering the information, then doing the calculation, critically reflecting it, sitting together with all uh, the other departments, colleagues, and maybe external parties, third parties, and so on. And it's also time consuming. Uh, so 
maybe better do it for more the bigger projects and or if you have more projects to compare for example five to ten and you have to decide just one yeah then it's really worth it because then um, you prevent um, taking the wrong decision uh, not fully not fully um, but you have a, a fundamental basis to say okay um, based on the figures it's project number three or project number seven and then you can discuss it with all the other stakeholders around um, starting at 500k 700k it gets really interesting um, applying these models because then there's really also the payoff uh, in, in the application itself um, in terms of, of branches or businesses i think everyone or every company and, and every branch can can apply these models there's no restriction at all and if it comes to the really really very sensitive part in terms of m a transaction so you want to acquire a company or maybe also you want to sell a, a part of your company or maybe an affiliate you have um, abroad you want to sell it then my recommendation also from academia is um, please go to <laughs> some of the tax advisors called pwc or deloitte uh, sorry no uh, advertising but one of the big fours and ask them to do the evaluation because um, then you're really, really safe. It costs a little bit of money, I know, but then you're really safe also if you have a tax audit a few years after, um, or I don't know, some of the authorities uh, knock on your door and say, ah, hello, we heard you sold the company very, very cheap to Bahama Island. Um, can we have a look at the calculation model and so on? Nah? So this is really when, it's, when it gets really sensitive. But at the end of the day, everyone uh, can apply it. Yeah, I, I can imagine there's a lot of specialists. Many years ago, I met a guy at an airport. He was obviously a very seasoned traveler. I asked him what he did. I said, oh, my job is to help negotiate, you know, bulk buying of flights uh, with airlines, you know, for companies, you know. And uh, I said, that sounds like a great job. He says, yes, it is. I fly first class everywhere and all the airlines really look after me. And then all I have to do is go in and say, no, that's too expensive. But they, so... I guess there's a lot of niches. What sort of hands-on experience have you had, Patrick, with, with this sort of thing? Or what sort of company could you help? If, is there a particular particular niche you'd be more familiar with or would be helpful at? Uh, in terms of experience, um, I think it's not really mandatory to have a certain kind of experience when it just comes uh, to the uh, model itself. So applying the model itself, you do not need any ex specific experience. Um, going the next step or the next two, three, four steps and being really the sparing partner of the management or doing it for your own company also, for example, if you are the owner, uh, then it's a really a huge advantage if you have the, the specific uh, branch know-how and the experience and so on. Um, because, for example, system gastronomy or in terms of restaurants, it's a little bit uh, different uh, than calculating um, scenarios uh, for the production side industry. Yeah? Um, duration length of uh, yeah, the, the usage of the machines is, is even longer. The equipment in restaurants, two, three years, uh, maybe some grill order like uh, breakdown. So, you have to keep a little bit more uh, in mind. Um, it's for sure an advantage, but not mandatory. Okay, great. And just before we wrap up, can you recommend any resources or books that really gives you a good grounding in this stuff if you want to get more knowledge on it? Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. Um, what I always recommend to my students, so it's uh, really for those of the audience who really want to dive uh, deep into the topic. It's a book um, called Corporate Finance by Berg de Marzo. Uh, maybe we can link it at the end of the day. And uh, there are some chapters uh, called, for example, the time value of money or interest rates and uh, investment decision rules, where all this, what I said in a very, very um, short way before, um, is explained very, very in detail. Um, so also no advertising. Uh, I do not get any fees uh, to, for promoting this uh, book. And also on the other side, um, on YouTube, uh, there are lots of um, 
finance experts uh, doing the calculation in Excel. So if you're really not familiar with the calculation itself, it's uh, quite easy um, in Excel to build it. Um, they do it step by step. It's a 15, 20 minutes video. So just look it. And uh, as a third, uh, very valuable source, uh, listen to the podcast. Very good. Okay, well, we'll put a link to that book. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you know where YouTube is. So that's fine. Search. Uh, so Patrick, thanks very much for joining us. How can people reach out and, and get in touch with you if they want to find out more? Connect with me on LinkedIn. Really appreciate it. Uh, or via James or via the podcast. I'm open for any question or if I can support in any other case or the like, uh, just reach out to me. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so that's Patrick Batka, very Irish name. I know it's Eastern European as well, but Pat, lots of Patricks here in Dublin too. So we have that connection. Thank you very much for listening to this uh, episode of Growth Profit Podcast. As you can see, I'm really interested and curious to dive into niche topics when it comes around uh, finance and making decisions like this. If you've got a topic you'd like to hear me talk about deep and dive deeper with, with an expert, maybe Patrick or someone else, you can email me, james.kennedy at procurementexpress.com with your ideas. And until the next one, thanks very much for listening.